Hello everyone, uh, this is Marve Ispahani from Columbia Global Centers, Istanbul. I would like to say a warm welcome on behalf of the Columbia Global Centers and thank you all for being with us today. We are delighted to bring you this workshop on the history of Ottoman history in collaboration with Columbia Global Centers, Tunis and the Sakıp Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies at Columbia University. Today's workshop follows from the Columbia seminar taught by two distinguished uh, scholars uh, in Ottoman history, Tunç Şen and Zeynep Çelik in fall 2019. The seminar was designed to discuss the formation of Ottoman Turkish historiography in the late Ottoman and early Republican um, Turkey. Zeynep Çelik is a distinguished professor of Ottoman and uh, Middle Eastern uh, history and architecture at the New Jersey Institute of uh, Technology. And uh, she also teaches at Columbia University. Her publications include the remaking of Istanbul, uh, a winner of uh, the Institute of Turkey Studies Book Award, displaying the Orient, urban forms and colonial uh, confrontations, Algiers under French rule, empire, architecture and the city, French Ottoman encounters, winner of the Society of Architectural Historians Spirokostov Book Award, and about antiquities, politics of archaeology in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Professor Chilik is also the recipient of the 2019 Giorgio Levi de la Vida Medal honoring outstanding achievement in Islamic studies. Uh, Tun Shen uh, is an assistant professor of history at Columbia University. He is a historian of the Ottoman Empire whose research and records of publications revolve around questions about the history of science and divination, perceptions of time, and manuscript culture in the early modern era. He's currently working on his first book uh, project, Masters of Time, Astrologers and Scientific Expertise at the Early Modern Ottoman Court, which examines the corpus of stargazers and measuring, displaying and interpreting time from chronological datings to the, to the designation of precise auspicious uh, moments. Uh, Tun Shan is also uh, a board member of our uh, faculty advisory uh, committee and we have done uh, many uh, programs uh, in collaboration uh, with Colombia on the history of the Ottoman Empire and we hope to do more on this topic. So before taking more of your time, I would like to pass the floor uh, to Tun Shan and Zeynep Çelik. Thank you. Thank you so much for this warm uh, introduction, Merve, uh, and many thanks to uh, Columbia Global Centers, Istanbul and Tunis, as well as the Sakıp Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies for hosting us. Uh, so today we will have a conversation, as Merve has just said, about the seminar uh, Professor Zeynep Çelik and I taught in fall 2019. So let me say a few things about the format today. Uh, so in the next 20, 25 minutes, Professor Chilik and I will talk about uh, how we designed the seminar in the first place and what we aim to accomplish. And then we will be joined by some of our students uh, who will share their own uh, reflections and engagements with the seminar. Uh, and after that, we will open the floor for a further discussion. Uh, there is, there should be a Q&A box uh, on, on uh, your screen. I'm talking to, to our audience today. So if you have any particular questions, please uh, post them on uh, the Q&A box and we'll try to address them in the Q&A session right after we've, we, we will be done with our own uh, sort of presentations. So, uh, the, the, the title of our seminar uh, in fall 2019 was uh, Margins of Ottoman Historiography, Ottoman Turkish Tradition. And as the title uh, itself suggests, uh, our primary goal was uh, to introduce our students uh, to an important but largely uh, overlooked body of scholarship on Ottoman history, uh, 
uh, produced overwhelmingly in Turkish in, in the first half of the 20th century. So we tried to cover a period from 1910s to 1950s and to 1960s, and we tried to introduce some of the principal works uh, uh, written at the time, again, mo mostly in Turkish. Uh, so how did we come up with this idea of designing such a seminar? Uh, let me say a few things about the history of, of the seminar. Uh, Professor Zeynep Çelik and I met in fall 2017 when I started teaching here at Columbia University. And uh, ever since our first meeting, uh, we realized uh, how much we enjoy talking about our shared interest uh, in the works and stories of earlier generations of Turkish scholars and historians figures like uh, Suheil Ünver, Osman Nuri Ergin, uh, Celal Esad Arsevan, Ömer Lütfi Barkan, Sabri Ülgener, or Ismail Hakkı Baltacoğlu. And many members of this generation, uh, including the most maybe renowned Ottoman historian of all time, Salih Dinalcı, uh, were born and raised in, in the final years of the empire, uh, but they gained prominence in the first decades of the Republican Turkey. Uh, so even this transition from the empire to republic and how these intellectuals and scholars position themselves through their writings uh, is an interesting question in and of itself. Uh, but we, uh, in addition to uh, addressing that sort of question, we wanted to see what kind of knowledge these earlier generations of scholars generated and the sources they unearthed in uh, many diverse areas, uh, from urban history and history of science to economic history and literary studies. And this literature uh, is still essential for any student of Ottoman history. Uh, but in the current state of Anglophone Ottoman studies, uh, this robust literature uh, has unfortunately been overlooked and marginalized. Uh, I mean, here in the U.S., uh, Ottoman history uh, became an integral part of history and area studies departments and curriculum uh, only after maybe 1970s and 80s. Uh, and as two Ottoman historians uh, based in the U.S., uh, we are particularly happy to see that uh, in the last couple of decades, more schools and departments uh, have hired Ottomanists who uh, produce new historical knowledge, uh, find creative ways to put the Ottoman history in conversation with uh, a broader theoretical uh, and historiographical inquiries, uh, and train the next generation of Ottoman specialists uh, to use the rich sources Ottomans have left, be they archival or manuscript or visual or architectural and so on and so forth. But one thing Professor Celik and I find uh, uh, alar alarming in the way Ottoman history has been taught and studied here in the U.S., especially in the last couple of decades, is this lack of engagement with the robust scholarship in Turkish produced before the 1960s and 70s. Uh, I mean, students and sometimes even the faculty of Ottoman history uh, may tend to engage only with the more recent, more theory-oriented Anglophone literature uh, of, let's say, uh, post-Saidian or post-Foucauldian or post-colonial uh, universe. And in the graduate seminars, sometimes are only assigned the recently published monographs. So we were a bit uneasy uh, seeing that uh, the faculty and students in the U.S. interested in Ottoman history are either... Uh, completely unaware or uh, widely dismissive of this earlier scholarship in Turkish. And as our conversations uh, have deepened, uh, we said, why don't we offer a seminar and assign some of these materials? And that's how we, we uh, began uh, designing it. Uh, and frankly, uh, we really didn't expect the high number of students because many of our readings were in Turkish and some even in Ottoman Turkish. Uh, but much to our pleasure, we ended up having uh, 16 registered students and some auditors, uh, many of which will be uh, with us today. Uh, so before giving the floor to Professor Çelik, let me say a few more things about 
what we aim to accomplish in the seminar. Uh, there are several established convictions uh, in, in the literature that we wanted to address and challenge uh, through the seminar. And one of uh, these uh, convictions is this uh, inaccurate assumption that uh, in the late Ottoman and early Republican periods, there was no serious and institutionally sound treatment, academic treatment of Ottoman history. What we wanted to show was quite the opposite. The period, again, roughly, speak, roughly from the 1910s to 1950s, uh, was intellectually a vibrant period that different aspects of Ottoman history started to be studied for the first time maybe on uh, modern academic uh, standards. Uh, several intellectual associations were founded in Istanbul and later also in Ankara, such as uh, the Ottoman uh, Historical Society, Tarihi Osmani in Germany, uh, founded in 1909. Uh, then the Research Council for Turkish Society, which later became Turkish Historical Association, established in the early 1930s. Uh, new academic institutions and faculties of humanities, again, were established at the period, such as the Darul Finun, which later was transformed into Istanbul University. Uh, and the Faculty of Letters uh, established in Ankara University in the late 1930s. And there was also a boom in the publication of academic journals like Belletan, the Vakuflar, Tarih Vesikalı, Belgeler, Turkiyat Mecmuası, Iktisat Fakültesi Mecmuası, and so on and so forth. So all of these institutions and publications just spearheaded the, the burgeoning of academic studies on, on diverse aspects of uh, Ottoman history. Uh, Another established conviction with which we had some issues is uh, about the nature of historical knowledge uh, produced by the earlier generations of scholars at this time. Uh, many today might think that uh, the literature produced at the time was just a dry political and military history of this and that Ottoman sultan and statesman. Uh, these uh, scholars are often criticized to just repeat what the early chronicles uh, recounted. Uh, so in the eyes of these critical uh, people, one could draw very little benefit from such a, a state-centric, dynasty-centric historical region. Uh, this critique is not altogether unfounded maybe, but it would be really too simplistic uh, to say that uh, the earlier generations of historians had no research interests other than political or military history. Uh, and one of the first uh, readings assigned in the seminar uh, was Yusuf Akçura's uh, Küçük Muhtara, uh, the short memo. Uh, Akçura himself was a Turkish Muslim intellectual uh, born in Russia and then migrated to Ottoman world. Uh, and he published this essay, a uh, very short essay in, in the early 1910s. And in that uh, essay, he underlined the urgency of writing the economic and social history of, uh, of the peasants and non-elites. Uh, so just two dec decades before what the founders of the Anal School in France would say in the 1920s and early 1930s. And when, uh, Designating our weekly themes, we also preferred non-political and non-military matters. And while doing that, we didn't have any problem finding sufficient material. So one week was devoted to history of science, another to urban history, yet another to visual culture, economic history, and literary studies. So the period and uh, the production of knowledge at the time gives enough uh, materials to cover uh, that range of, uh, of themes. Uh, so one last thing, uh, and this is also about another false assumption, so stating that the earlier Ottoman historians were not really engaged with theoretical debates in contemporary Europe, uh, and there was no serious intellectual exchange between them and the broader uh, international community of scholars. But this assumption was simply not true. And again, we had little difficulty uh, presenting counter, uh, counter evidence. If you look, for example, at the works of uh, 
Suheil Ünver or İsmail Akkı Baltacıoğlu uh, in the history of science or in the history of art, you would see that uh, they wrote these pieces as kind of direct response to what the late 19th and early 20th century Western uh, scholar, European scholars were thinking about the Ottoman and, and the Turkish uh, history. Uh, and they often criticized, very harshly criticized their European peers and predecessors uh, for their racially and culturally biased claims about, uh, about the uh, Ottoman Turkish history. Uh, and they criticized their European peers for their ability of using primary sources in Turkish or in other uh, uh, languages. And in terms of intellectual exchanges between this uh, particular generation of Ottoman historians and, uh, and the international community of scholars, uh, they are certainly part of the broader network. I mean, the Inter International Congress of Orientalists uh, convened in every two to three years were well attended by some of the members of this Turkish generation of scholars. Uh, figures like Suheil Unvar or Adnan Adıvar were writing in conversation with uh, European and American historians of science at the time. Uh, Omer Lutfi Barkan was one of the first reviewers of Fernand Brodel's uh, colossal work, Mediterranean. And the examples can be easily multiplied, but uh, I think I should uh, stop here uh, and leave the floor to Professor Chilik. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. Um, I will be talking about the sources very briefly, uh, expanding on some of Professor Chen's uh, um, points, uh, but adding some others and, um, and they will all come together, especially after the students uh, finalize their uh, presentations. Now, our sources may look like a very random collection even like a complete chaos. But there is a method to our madness, a method that is pertinent to the goals of the seminar as outlined so well by Professor uh, Shen. The sources are spread all over the place. They cover topics from economic history to history of science to art history. We even included a couple of poems. The reason for this again, as explained by Professor Shen, was to cast an overall view to many branches of history in an interconnected manner to establish commonalities and threads. In fact, the seemingly disconnected sources revealed meaningful associations when read closely. They began to coalesce into coherent discourses. Let me illustrate with one set of unlikely examples. There are many, many, many. What could link Halil Inalcik's analysis of Bursa's 15th century economy with Suheil Unver's monograph on painter Nakshi? These empirically exemplary pieces, both from the 1940s, agree on a methodological argument. That is, all aspects of Ottoman history should be based on archival research. The shared position by an economic social historian and an art historian, although Unver was everything else, <laughs> in this context, he's an art historian. So their position was taken against Europeans who dominated their respected fields but who did not engage in primary archival research. Ilanchuk and Unvar maintained that they were not even equipped to do that. They're very explicit. They give names and they are extremely loud in this criticism. So archives were central to our discussions. Our students proved to be familiar with the archives, most notably with the Bashbakan Garshid. They had not seen a single original document, but had already compiled online many, many documents related to their research. The thorny issue was what to do with the embarrassment 
of uh, Richard. Even if Professor Shen and I could not provide solutions to this dilemma, we thought it would be useful to think about archival research then and now, then meaning the 1970s and the 1980s. We invited professors Leslie Pierce and Shukru Haniolo and had a very lively meeting. We delved into the pros and cons of then and now, as well as the continuing sagas. As an historic background, we read a passionate article written in 1910 by Abdul Rahman Sheref on the dismal state of the documents. This was published in Tari Osmani and Jumeni Mejmoz. Abdul Rahman Sheref's creed occur was at the same time a call for institutionalizing the Ottoman American archive, systematizing it, and housing it in a building as, it, as impressive as the one he had visited in Vienna and Paris. Well, we've come a long way. The photograph of our poster shows the Bashbakandik archive in the 1930s. Uh, many of you know what the new building looks like, for better or for worse. Another one of our goals was to bring forth the important role played by institutions in writing history of the late Ottoman, early Turkish Republican era. Our reading list is derived largely from scholarly journals published by institutions such as Tari Osmani and Jumeni, later his Turkish History Foundation, and various departments of Istanbul Darul and Ankara University as uh, Professor Shan outlined. Among these are journals of economics, law, humanities, and divinity departments. Add to the list of his institutions the general director of Vakıf, Vakıflar Genel Müdürlüğü, with the indispensable Vakıflar Dergisi, a truly interdisciplinary publication. I, am, I may be forgetting others, but you should get a clear picture of a very strong institutional, I should say, state support for scholarship. These periodicals are full of gems and exciting surprises. Think of coming across Ismail Hakkı Baltacoğlu's informed, complex, critical, and extensive article on Turkish art. This was published in the Journal of the School of Divinity in 1926. The article is packed with much food for thought. Decades later, in the 1970s, when Oleg Grabar made very similar arguments about Islamic art, they were considered groundbreaking. How parochial scholarship can be, I should say Western scholarship can be. Our primary sources did not remain within the institutional frame and included other publications. Just to give one relatively obscure example, for our discussion on destinization, we brought in Abdul Hadi's 1923 essay titled Sharchilik Le Garchilik Look, ve Garçılık from independent periodical uh, Mihra that translates as um, Orientalism and Occidentalism. Mehmet Akif's lyrics of the Turkish national anthem provided another provocative perspective to the topic. We sing the national anthem without thinking about its words. They are amazingly loaded. Nazım Hikmet's epic poem, Sheikh Bedrettin Destanı, came from an anti-establishment context, even though it was produced in a state institution, the Bursa prison, in 1936. The poem opened yet another window, or I should say several windows, into interpreting, writing, and even fabricating history. Um, as I said in the beginning, we're going to expand this brief discussion of our sources with the presentations of our students and hopefully during the Q&A session. But now I will attempt to give a list of the themes to which we return over and over during the, the semester. 
please uh, note that my list is incomplete and does not follow any order. Let me start with dialogues with European discourses, the sources of inspiration, the influences, but also the quarrels. Orientalism popped up in every session. The myth of a rupture between late Ottoman earth and early Republican discourses. The charged historic context, politics, theory and history. Historian subjectivity and imagination. Historian as an individual. Historian and the world around him. Identity, belonging and excluding. Ideologies. For example, Ottomanism, Turkism, nationalism, communism, there are others. Issues of ethnicity and race, class. And finally, Istanbul centrism of the discourse and the absences in the discourse, two very intriguing themes. With this list, let us see the students on the screen and we will start with um, the first presentation. Um, we will start with uh, Yasin Abjagina, who is a third year PhD student in the history department at Columbia, specializing in the histories of science and temporality in the 18th and 19th centuries Ottoman Empire. Yasin. Hi everyone, uh, it's wonderful to be here and thank you for the, to the Istanbul Global Center staff and also Professor Celik and Professor Shen for letting us speak at this forum. Um, and also for doing, putting on this course, it was, it was a really great experience. So um, as someone who was, uh, you know, exposed to the product of, of uh, Ottoman historiography through my high school education in Turkey in the late 2000s, it was very valuable to see how some of the historical arguments that are taught um, as part of the sort of definitive account of Ottoman history in high schools were constructed actually through debates that were taking places that, that, that were taking place in the pages of historical journals like uh, Belletan and Vakuflar. Uh, specifically, it was very interesting to see the rigor and robustness of uh, early Republican and mid-century Turkish historical scholarship and how it was in conversation with global historical scholarship as well. Um, I think uh, among the reasons many of us choose to conduct PhDs in the United States today, aside from the funding, uh, is the sort of tested acknowledgement of the rigor of scholarship produced out of selective US universities. And part of that tested acknowledgement, at least to me, stems from this understanding that the approach to history in, in these PhD programs are as concerned with philosophical and theoretical questions as they are with empirical ones. In contrast, the Turkish scholarship from, at least from what I am reading, and or rather I was reading in recently published Ottoman history dissertations available from the uh, YÖK or higher education online database, they are often focused around the translation of manuscripts and provide sort of valuable, very valuable empirical data, but often they do not process that data and deduce from it cogent historical arguments, let alone uh, more meta arguments on the nature of history itself. So what this course showed me is that the present state of these dissertations, perhaps published outside of the, the top few universities in Turkey, is not uh, a, an accurate or an ever present representation of the history of Ottoman and Turkish historical scholarship itself. So a theoretical sensibility that I had perhaps wrongly assumed was missing from Turkish historical scholarship was present uh, clearly in the exchanges between the works of Fernand Brodal and Omar Lutfi Barkan, for instance. Uh, it was pleasantly surprising to see how uh, Omar Lutfi Barkan, um, yes, yeah, so it was very surprising to see how, for instance, Omar Lutfi Barkan challenged the sort of late, late 20th century historiographical consensus of the Ottoman Empire as, you know, sort of bound to decline, you know. Uh, in, and, and he was challenging that in the pages of Belletan as early as 1970 with his article um, on Altınca Asrın İkinci Yarısında Türkiye'de Fiyat Hareketleri or uh, in English translation, it's the price revolution of the 16th century, a turning point in the economic history of the Near East. And he was challenging this consensus uh, from the point of uh, 
from the standpoint of an economic historian uh, whose perspective allowed him to point to the role played by the emerging Atlantic economy, which is largely neglected in these conversations, especially in the Ottomanist camps. Um, so the course also showed me uh, how fertile ground Istanbul University and Ankara University were for historical debates in the mid-century into the 80s, producing in impactful scholars like Shukru Haniolo. Uh, we were also very lucky to receive a master class with Professor Haniolo and Professor Leslie Pierce, where they told us about their journeys, writing their dissertations. Um, it was very exciting to see, you know, how much attention to detail and they had and how much courage they had going into the spaces that were very unfamiliar to them, dealing with people around them who did not speak the languages that they spoke, especially in the case of Professor Haniolo, who was in Albania doing research and hearing him talk about uh, the troubles and toils that went into that dissertation really just gave us a perspective on Turkish historical scholarship uh, and how strenuous it was, uh, but also how rewarding it was. So uh, another, my final point uh, is that I think traditional courses will often posit, you know, Köprülü and Inaljuk as the sort of doyans of Ottoman history. And uh, this, they won't really consider the sort of agonism surrounding these mighty historians and will treat someone like Mustafa Akda uh, perhaps as a foil, if he is mentioned at all. So this course was special in introducing us introducing to us not simply the sort of gatekeepers of Ottoman historiography, but also figures who challenged the, the gatekeeping, the very gatekeeping that was present within this scholarly tradition, including people like Mustafa Akda, Halil Bertay, Suhail Inver. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasemin, uh, for sharing your wonderful insights. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Nancy Cole. Uh, Nancy is a second year PhD student in the History Department at Columbia University, uh, and she is interested in um, uh, the intersection of Jewish philanthropy with the social and political construction of Jewish differences in, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, so Nancy, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Professor Shen. And first, I wanted to echo Yasemin uh, in expressing my gratitude to Professor Chalik and Professor Shen for um, including us um, in this amazing initiative. So when prompted to reflect um, on what this class has offered me as a scholar, I was reminded of an article I had once read um, by one Serkan Delija, who is a, uh, an historian, a cultural and social historian of uh, queer history in the Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey, um, an article about historicizing the concept of male friendship as it applied to Ottoman Janissaries, in which uh, Delija asks, and I'll, I'll um, paraphrase or translate into English from the Turkish, he asks, how and at what expense does the historian imagine individuals as subjects of a certain experience? But more importantly, how and at what expense do the individuals themselves recognize themselves as subjects of a certain experience? So the primary insight I think of this seminar for me has been that historians are also historical subjects and also subjects of a certain experience that we then narrate back into the past. Um, the only thing is that as Pia Bourdieu put it in his famous book on academic culture, Homo Academicus, we don't like to think of ourselves that way any more than a doctor would like to consider himself a patient. So the question that I came, came up with was how do we narrate the, the patterns that we notice in our historical subjects and in a way in our colleagues past and present in terms of their context or their legacies or even their resonances. For instance, on one hand, uh, Sabri Ulgenar being known as the Turkish Weber already poses all of the epistemic issues of what Deepesh Chakrabarty um, has often called the waiting room of history. And yet, as we saw in our class, Ulgenar himself articulated the notion of the Muslim or Turkish zihniyet not as a critique of, but actually as a, a kind of counterpart to Weber's Protestant ethic. And in my own research for this course, I've also had to grapple with this question of what it means to see historians themselves as historical subjects um, impacted by their and our um, particular contexts. Um, I told the unlikely story of the unlikely 
mutual emergence of Sephardic and Mizrahi studies from an earlier body of scholarship, one that was at once helmed by the uh, very prominent at the time, Ottoman and Turkish Jewish historian Avraham Galante, who was an autodidact born in Bodrum and uh, actually once held the chair in history at Istanbul Universitesi until 1933 when he was dismissed and also deeply intertwined um, with the history of a French Jewish film fabric organization founded in 1860, whose primary goal was to civilize the Jews of the Orient, uh, which was called the Alliance Israelite Universelle. Now, Galante's assimilationist politics and his dismissals of Zionism as a significant political force have perhaps correctly been diagnosed as apologetic, but as the seminar highlighted, one of the central methodological challenges of writing history is not merely to judge you know, whether our historical subjects were correct in their predictions or not, but rather to untangle the dialectic between history writing and history doing itself, right? While also writing about that dialectic process through time. So this story became as much about how Galante's representations of the Ottoman Jewish past were epigenetically inherited by subsequent generations of scholars, um, as it is about the historians' representations themselves. I argue that both Sephardic and Mizrahi studies have been shaped not only by the tumultuous events of the late 20th century, but also by the everyday anxieties of late Ottoman citizenship as they related to the French or Ottoman civilizing mission, for that matter. And it sort of seeing through the kaleidoscope of these nested nostalgias, I was led to reflect on how historicizing a field um, whose foundational text, you know, sort of begins with uh, uh, Edward Said's Orientalism might lead us to question what we mean when we talk about legacies and how to deal with the resonances that we see in the archive from our present day position. So Zainab Hojam already mentioned Abdul Haq Hadi's Eshak Jalak, his uh, 1923 text, um, which led me to think, you know, what do we mean, for instance, when we say that the Sayyidin critique of Orientalism had a predecessor in Ottoman thought? What aspects are we tracing when we go from the culture of comparison between East West that we witnessed in Nazm Hikmet, in Aydin Sayla, in Adnan Adabar, who is Halide Edip's sort of lesser known husband, to the Cold War geopolitics of Said's time to today. Now, I don't say this to depoliticize the 18th and 19th centuries, but rather to politicize complexity, to suggest that something more textured than Orientalism is going on in the mid-century culture of comparison, or rather that the historical genealogy of Orientalism is more textured than we tend to appreciate today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, and I would I'd like to particularly thank you for citing the name Sabri Ulgenar, whose name I uh, forgot to mention during my own presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Eric Blackthorn Obar. Uh, he is an incoming third year doctoral student in uh, the Middle East, South Asian and African Studies Department at Columbia University. And his research mainly focuses on uh, representations of Iran in late Ottoman media and literary culture. Uh, yes, Eric. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I first wanted to thank Professor Shannon Chelik, uh, Elam Nazatash Demir, and the Columbia Global Center in Istanbul for the opportunity to speak in this setting, and I'm really enjoying the discussion so far. Um, so as a researcher interested primarily in literary discourse, um, I have in my academic career taken a few seminars on the subjects of, broadly speaking, Ottoman and Turkish literature, both in North America and in Turkey. And there is, I think, a certain pattern to those courses which attempt to integrate both the study of literary texts and literary historiography into their syllabi, which is a start from a kind of macro scale general overview of the place of Ottoman and Turkish literature within a contemporary global context, and then to work back through specific texts and works of criticism to support or publicize this emplacement. And yeah, we've all, you know, I'm sure we can imagine literature of modernity, literature of post-imperialism, literature of post-colonial, things like this. And while this technique works to establish a general narrative of literary history with certain defined breaks, the works of historiography end up in this framing acting more as sort of disconnected supplementary texts without a literary or referential tradition of their own. To give a particularly well-known example, uh, Ahmed Hamdi Tantanar's Literary History of the Late Ottoman Period, Ontokuzunju Asur Turk Edebiyat Tarihi, 
is often supplied in current literary historiography as a sort of isolated work with a kind of idiosyncratic take on the emergence of the Turkish reading public and novelist tradition, and totally separate from that of the early public era ideologues. And, you know, and having never read, for instance, Fuat Kopulu's 1913 program for the study of Turkish literary history, I too was under, also under the impression that the literary historiography of the early Republic, let alone the late Ottoman period, was too fixated on partisan ideological or even aesthetic debates to represent a coherent and systematic historiographic discourse and debate. However, as I learned from both the course material and from my final project, which was an annotated bibliography tracing the historiographic concern of the emergence of the Turkish novel, in fact, there was a lively and multifaceted debate surrounding the canonicity, authenticity, and social importance of the Turkish novel long before Tanpanar's study. And there was likewise a variety of theoretical approaches and periodizations, which are actually quite rigorous. And rather than acting as a kind of idiosyncratic lone scholar, Tanpanar's arguments can be seen to have been built on earlier works by Mustafa Nihat Ozan, Aga Surdelevent, Partev Meli Boratov, and, and also responding to more official historiography promulgated by Ismail Habib Sevuk and others. And in class, we also looked at more, let's say, polemical works of literary criticism by Abdul Baki Gulpanarla and Payami Safa, as well as works blurring the lines between history and literature, such as Nazim Hikmet's works and Rashad Ekrem Kochu's various projects. And thus, in a course that was not solely devoted to literary history, we in fact undertook a quite multifaceted survey of a rich literary historiographic tradition. And it was, I think, the particular attitude of the class that allowed us to really engage with this discourse, which is to not understand these texts as primary sources, which speak only to a mentality or political concerns, but instead as the work of fellow historians, exploring similar questions and deploying techniques and methods which continue to hold relevance to our own research. It was in this sense that the perspectives of Professors Chelik and Shen, along with our guest speakers, Leslie Pierce and Shukuru Haniolu, I think proved truly invaluable because they encourage us to think not only about the results of these historians' research, but about the entirety of their process, the practical concerns of dealing with largely uncatalogued archival material under fairly onerous conditions, uh, of departmental and bureaucratic conflicts, attempting to balance theoretical scope with a depth of historical research and of changes in the nature of historical writing itself. And indeed, although I don't think that the title of the course, Margins of Historiography, was intended this way, I get the sense that much of what we focused on was precisely this sort of marginalia of the history writing process, the immense hidden efforts and struggles upon which the finished product depends. And thinking through these aspects not only gave me a greater appreciation for these works of you know, seemingly outdated history, but made me more conscious of where my own work sits in relation to this tradition. Thank you, Eric. Our next um, presenter is Ali Uurlu, who is a PhD student in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia. Uh, Ali's uh, research is on the secularist and socialist movements and their relationship to the history of capitalism in the late Ottoman world. Ali. Thank you, Professor Chadik. Um, so many thanks to all who have made this webinar possible and special thanks to Professor Chilik and Professor Shan for conceiving of and carrying out such an important seminar. Um, so we've heard the aims of the course from the professors and so in the following brief presentation, I just wanna reflect on the ways in which the seminar has provoked my own work. So a portion of my own work deals with the difficulties arising from the fact of inhabiting a secular world and at the same time thinking about the very becoming of this world in a specific context in the late Ottoman Empire and the early Tur uh, Turkish Republic. So when I say we inhabit a secular world, I, can, I conceive of it as an inseparable entang entanglement um, with modern science and capitalism as both determinants of thought and organizers of social formations of which humans, we humans are a part. Um, and a, so a crucially bedeviling consequence of this circularity that I just mentioned is the difficulty of writing about the becoming of a secular life world by deploying concepts and categories 
laden with presumptions that hold together the kind of world we were aiming to describe. So the human body and soul, the social nature, infrastructure, the economy, the material and immaterial, amongst others, often are prefigured in a tendentious taxonomy uh, that is strictly historical. So in thinking about a historical epistemology, that is the kinds of shifts undergone by concepts and categories in tandem with larger changes in the archaeology of thought, critical theory has been of utmost benefit in interrogating the premises of central concepts such as history, the social power, and the economy, and obvious and the obvious in my, uh, in my case, the secular, right? So how might ultimate historians and historiography benefit from a conversation with critical theory? This open-ended question was a recurring one throughout our seminar in fall 2019. One instance of this was during the History of Science Week, uh, the assigned readings for which, as mentioned by Nancy, included those by Adnan Adivar, Ad Aydin Sayla, and Jamil Aydin. Surprising to many of us was the tone of the analyses by early pioneers of uh, history of science like Adivar and Sayilda, whose treatises for the most part mirrored those of their European counterparts in locating the cause of the lack of scientific thinking amongst Ottomans due to the heightened role of religiosity. Expectedly, a common if knee-jerk reaction uh, was to conceive of these pioneers as regurgitators of Orientalist tropes about Ottoman society and sciences, often presumed to be the consequence of the internalization of Western biases by Ottoman elites and intelligentsia. But if critical theory aims to make sense of a society as a whole in its historical specificity, uh, for example, how cultural phenomena are related to the material world from which they are emergent, then there might be more to be said about the use of theories, concepts, and categories out of their context. Rather than treating them as imports out of their context, we may be better off trying to figure out the very appeal of these concepts in other locales, which, as it's been recently argued, may tell us a thing or, thing or two about the global in the 19th century. So kind of like how theory is transmitted and, and moves, right? So in this vein, Professor Chilik and Professor Shen's class provided me with the opportunity to think about, to think more about this complex and yet rewarding approach to texts and translations by intellectuals of the 19th century. For my final assignment, I closely read a translation of a G German political economy book that was published in 1852, translated to French at some point, and eventually made its way into Ottoman in 1869. Despite being one of the earliest examples of political economy texts in Ottoman, as Denis Kulincholu has shown, the book was translated by two people into, into Ottoman within the same year. The translation I chose to focus on, undertaken by an obscure figure, Mehmet Mitat, uh, was markedly different from the one done by Ahmed Hilmi. Mitat's book sought to completely vernacularize the text with the goal of educating the commoners. In his foreword and in the main body of the text, Mitat continuously contextualized the importance of Fenni Idare and substantiated the book's claims with potential benefits for Ottoman society, often urging that uh, the knowledge of Fenni Idare may benefit the unification of workers, for example. Um, not, not to mention the use of certain categories and concepts, um, which I think are quite significant in this translation. So, in the text, labor is abstracted from the specific activity it usually entailed, like spinning or weaving, and so on and so forth. So I think that Mitat's translation, especially his foreword, may give intellectual, intellectual and social historians important insights into the kind of life world in which he wrote, complicating the, kind, the, the notion of the transmission of a text from A to B as a locatable vector of movement. The nuances of the blurring between original translation, origin replication, also further displaces, uh, displaces and destabilizes the perhaps the most modern epistemic division of all, that between reality and representation. And so I just wanted to wrap it up and say that this invaluable seminar not only familiarized the students with an earlier and understudied historiograph historiographical tradition, but just as importantly introduce us to a trove of eclectic archives to think further critically about the late Ottoman and early Republican period itself. So thank you. Thank you, Ali. The word is now Johanna's. Johanna Rosaki-Siu is a second year 
history PhD student at Princeton University. She's an early modernist. She's interested in the study of empires, specifically focusing on the Ottoman Portuguese encounter in the Indian Ocean. Johanna. Thank you. First of all, I wanted to express how thankful I am for the opportunity to take this class at Columbia University, even though I'm not a student at Columbia. And this class allowed me not only to get to know Professor Cilic and Professor Shen, but also uh, my fellow students. And I think we brought together a wide range of research interests <clears throat> in the seminar that I found um, extremely inspiring. And I learned a lot, not only from the professors, but also from my peers. When I was thinking about what I want to tell you about in this class today, I first was thinking about my own research focus. In the course of the seminar, I have discovered and read um, late Ottoman as well as Turkish um, historians who wrote about the Ottoman Indian Ocean, which interests me. However, the most important thoughts I think uh, that I took out of this class were of a different nature. In this seminar, we discussed the formation of the Turkish discipline of history, modern, modern discipline of history. And to me, this was more like a history 500 class than an Ottoman history class. So more like an introduction to the study of history for graduate students in which the fundamentals of our understanding of history are touched upon. The readings and our class discussions make me think again and more critically, more critically about the academic and also non-academic writing or let me better say production of history. I want to point out uh, two areas in the following, archives and conceptual conceptualization. For new reflection on this um, matter of history production, it mattered that this historiography class was focused on Turkish and late Ottoman historians, because this provided a very different perspective on the study of history, um, different from what I have typ typically heard in historiography classes. For example, while my general introduction into history seminar at my university had started out with reading Hegel, this class started out with the archives and the idea of establishing an archive in the first place. Of course, regarding the strong positivist tradition in Turkish scholarship, this may not be surprising. However, these were class discussions that I have never had before. We spoke about the materiality of archives, the act of collecting, and cataloging and appraising materials and how this was interwoven with the formation of the Turkish historiographic tradition. And we also talked about the challenge to use these archives today. In the course of this discussion, this learning was important for me and my future work. My generation of historians will have a new take on the production of Ottoman history based on a changed archive situation or archive experience. We can draw from all the work previous generations have done cataloging and assessing documents and making them available to us. Therefore, our work will be less entrenched in the materiality of the archives and instead will focus more on conceptual, on the conceptual interpretative level. Sadly, this also means that we will work less and less with, original, with originals and I'm convinced that this will also change how we concept our own conception of sources in the long run. As Professor Chilik has mentioned, if you go to the Bashbakan League today, you will not work on original documents anymore. The question of conceptual work, of course, touches upon my research directly. The most prominent book on the Ottoman Indian Ocean holds, holds the title, The Ottoman Age of Exploration, and it embodies a big dilemma for Ottoman historiography. And for me personally, regarding the question of how I will approach my own research. The age, of the age of exploration is a concept that was created on the, best, on the basis of Western European sources. If we apply it on the Ottomans, will we not automatically step into the trap to fit, to fit in our sources into this pre-existing theoretical superstructure? And what did the author of this book aim for by choosing this title? Surely he wanted to integrate Ottoman history into a global narrative instead of regarding the Ottoman Empire as an isolated entity with its own historic principles, which is something I want to aim for as well. But the author also wanted to show that Ottomans are just as progressive as the Europeans were. This opens up the whole discussion about an Europe-Ottoman dichotomy and the question of backwardness that we all seek to overcome. 
So the question for me is to what extent do we need to engage with pre-existing concepts in historiography? And at what point do we need to do our own conceptual work based on our own sources to advance the field of Ottoman history? Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna. Uh, our next speaker is Xavier Wingen, who is a PhD candidate in the joint program for history and Middle East and Islamic studies at uh, our peer institute, New York, in New York University. Uh, in his dissertation, uh, Xavier is exploring uh, how changing Ottoman conceptions of race and slavery and blackness uh, contributed to new forms of uh, racialization of enslaved and manumitted Africans from uh, the mid 19th to the early 20th century. Uh, yes, Xavier. Um, thank you. Um, so I want to thank um, Zainab and Tun Chodra for inviting us to be here as well as um, everyone that has come together to make this possible, as well as the attendees. Um, so over the course of the seminar, I discovered um, early on how many of these writings came to dramatically shape how we understand the Ottoman Empire today. One of the most striking features of the course uh, was the attention to the types of sources that Ottoman historians deployed. I think there's often a sense that you're Ottoman historian that <laughs> automatically means you're going to the archives. And so we got a very rich exploration of the kinds of materials um, such as um, the, uh, such as uh, urban urban uh, architecture, literature, and so on. Um, but for my interest, uh, I think that our focus in the archives highlighted that that both uh, the numerous archival de uh, depositories that were available and in great detail uh, described their internal logic of their organization which I found quite useful um, as a kind of burgeoning historian. You don't necessarily get these very, here's exactly what this, this, this phone means um, all the time in class. Um, our discussions as well uh, also revealed um, both how the Ottoman Empire quote unquote functioned or at least could be understood, which helped clarify my own patterns for sifting through my dissertation archival materials. Um, moreover, key works by scholars such as Kadeem K, Halil Inaljuk, and Bernard Lewis were instrumental in directing my attention to how generational lineages between academics also shape the field. Um, I've been recently thinking a lot about citational politics and what that really means in terms of my own project and also in terms of reading through the footnotes of others. Um, and so one of the articles that I loved returning to throughout the semester was Heath Lowry's State of the Field article, seeing uh, who's completed their degree under who. Um, and, you know, sometimes by reading acknowledgments, you can't, you can somewhat detect these lineages, but it was really through the seminar that we began to understand how these lineages affect the curve or direction of research, um, and as well as understand the social lives that go both in academia and also in the archives. So one of the examples that's been brought up was the uh, moment that we had to speak with professors Leslie Pierce and Shukri Haneolu, um, where they kind of like really got really into the dirt of like, this is what I had to do to get to this, this archive. I had to like talk to this person. I really just had to sit there and say, hey, can you help me with this document? Um, and while we might not necessarily have that moment to sit and say, hey, can you help me pour over this document because we're separated by these screens and things like that. Um, there's still this kind of weird sociality that's being built now, I think. Um, and in terms of my own work since the seminar, I've continued to read more works in Ottoman historiography and around it. And I've noticed the extent to which Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire does not feature um, or does uh, in conversations in the context of global slavery. So one of the ways that I've been looking at this is by paying attention to Ehu Toledan, uh, Professor Ehu Toledano's earlier writings and thinking about who he's in conversation with, um, the kinds of comparative perspectives. One of the chief examples I think out there uh, are, is the, is, um, what is his name? Orlando Patterson's uh, Slavery and Social Death. Um, I've been paying attention to kind of the years of publication. So Toledano's work was in the 1980s. This book comes out in 1983. And kind of seeing how this debate unfolds um, has been really, really interesting in light of this course. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, it is now Azat's turn. Azat Bilaluddinov is a third year PhD student 
working on Russian Ottoman entanglements in the 19th century uh, with an emphasis on Russian Orientalists. Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, professors uh, Tun Chen and uh, Zainab Chedik, uh, and as well as to the organizers of this webinar and to all the attendees. Uh, so uh, I'm coming from, so my primary field is Russian imperial history. And uh, this course uh, introduced me to a lot of uh, uh, new things. It was a great exposure to the historical literature on the Ottoman Empire in Turkish. So whereas previously I was uh, mostly reading um, works on um, uh, the Ottoman Empire in uh, English, Russian, a little German. Uh, so this course provided uh, invaluable insights into key figures of Turkish Republic, Republican historiographic traditions. Uh, I enjoyed how we combined discussions of Ottoman social, economic, intellectual, urban history, history of science with critical reflections on Turkish Republican historiography. That was an exercise in intellectual history in its own right as many uh, uh, other students have also emphasized that we explored this intellectual genealogies uh, and uh, uh, historiographical schools. Uh, the professors encouraged us to problematize uh, many cliches, uh, most important among which was um, uh, uh, that uh, there was a radical rupture between Ottoman and between the Ottoman and the uh, Republican cultural and intellectual experience. So among other things, I was particularly interested in how intellectuals of the Republican Turkey appropriated the Ottoman history and literary tradition. So this um, um, kind of uh, connects to my um, uh, interest in um, historical and cultural memory. So another thing that I was especially enthusiastic about was uh, history writing in the Republic in Turkey, what theories, methodologies, and political beliefs influenced those historians. So uh, there were three authors that uh, stood out for me. Uh, uh, Nazim uh, Hikmet, uh, Ahmed Hamdi Tapinar, and uh, Fuad Kapuru. Uh, so they can they can be considered together insofar as all of them raise questions to a large extent design prescriptions on how um, their contemporaneous uh, society should should deal with the past so i read uh, uh, uh as a manifestation of anxieties uh, over erosion of uh, what many thought as uh, historical historically determined identity that were typical for intellectuals in rapidly modernizing societies. Uh, Tanpenar's response to this challenge um, in his conceptualization of a dialogue between the past and the present uh, as a means to reach, uh, quote, authentic understanding of our own people. Um, uh, another quote, the past does exist, we have to settle and come to terms with it in order to live a genuine life creative reflections on the history of uh, architecture, art, and historical artifacts uh, could give uh, meaning to the present as this, many of these intellectuals thought. Uh, I, I found it very interesting how Tanpenar um, conceives of time. So as Professor uh, Tun Chan mentioned uh, in the beginning of our conversation that uh, the influence and collaboration and the um, uh, engagement of the um, uh, Republican intellectuals with the broader European intellectual trends is often overlooked and uh, uh, uh, Tantanar um, uh, from, from the readings that we engaged with, it is clear that he was under the influence of uh, French philosopher Henri Bergson, who developed theory of duration. Uh, uh, so the idea that the past could expand into the present was uh, uh, probably favored by 
Tampenar uh, and other intellectuals because it allowed to bridge the gap between tradition and uh, modern age. Uh, Hikmet was uh, also an interesting um, uh, author for me. I grew up uh, in uh, Russia and there were a lot of Soviet translations of left-wing um, communist writers and they had uh, a biography of Tampenar on my shelf. Uh, and um, along with the classics of uh, uh, uh, Russian and uh, European literature. Uh, so, and I was, uh, I know uh, who he was, but it was interesting to uh, read his, um, the epic of Sheikh uh, Bedreddin. Uh, so when it tells a um, uh, familiar sto uh, story, uh, uh, how uh, uh, many intellectuals engage with a distant part, uh, distant past, uh, and find some uh, angles to look at it, which would resonate with their ideological uh, premises. Um, so, and Copperus um, was uh, also an extremely interesting piece that we read. Uh, surprisingly, uh, even uh, from the late Ottoman period, published in 1913, and uh, it uh, showed uh, how um, he was, in a way, kind of ahead of his time uh, in theorizing uh, uh, literature and the relationship between literature and history. So, and po perhaps we can, in a way, call him a harbinger of uh, various. Uh, strands of historical research that came into prominence much later, such as history of emotions, history of mentalities. Um, yeah, and the last thing I would like to mention is that uh, um, I'm very grateful to both professors that they designed their course in a way that they provide numerous options for final assignments, not just a regular uh, research or historiographic paper, but also uh, some of us uh, could uh, choose to uh, combine um, uh, a bibliography uh, built in accordance to his or her interests. And uh, uh, the most interesting for me was an interview with uh, a well-established Ottomanist um, uh, senior Ottomanist uh, and uh, you know, conducting an interview, um, Ottoman history podcast like, or um, um, new books in history or uh, Turkey book talks uh, kind of interview, which was, which was aimed to focus uh, on uh, uh, kind of intellectual biography of uh, a certain uh, scholar uh, with an interest on, uh, in, uh, you know, um, institutional um, and uh, uh, intellectual influences uh, and how this particular historian reflects on uh, uh, those issues, uh, what encounters with uh, um, Ottomanists in uh, North American context as well as in Turkey and worldwide made them uh, or what they thought made them um, you know uh, embark on a certain uh, path of uh, research uh, and I conducted an interview with uh, Professor uh, Virginia Aksan, uh, who is uh, retired now, and uh, uh, and she uh, produced works in the on the military history of the uh, 18th century Ottoman Empire and uh, uh, brought back the interest to military history in a way like uh, in um, military and society the the relationship between military and the broader uh, Ottoman society. It was extremely useful exercise for me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Azat. Uh, and our final speaker is uh, Jordan Cannon. And Jordan was our only undergraduate student in the department. She's no more an undergraduate. Uh, 
she received her degree, dual degree in history and Middle East uh, studies here at Columbia University. Uh, and she is now joining to the joint PhD program uh, at Harvard University in history and Middle East studies. Uh, we're extremely sorry to have lost her to Harvard, uh, but <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. All right, Jordan, the floor is all yours. I wanted to say that I'm very grateful for the overview that this seminar gave me um, of the major works and trends, institutions, figures in Ottoman Turkish historiography in the first half of the 20th century. Um, in a very practical sense, um, it showed me where to first look for sources depending on my research interests or questions. And it also familiarized me with the context in which those sources were produced and shaped by which I found really helpful. Um, as others have touched upon, I also really appreciate the sort, the sort of rare personal element that this seminar had. Um, we read interviews with and heard in person from leading scholars in the field like about how they first came to work on Ottoman and Turkish history, um, and also how working in the archives changed over time and their personal anecdotes about that. Um, so that hearing all of that was really delightful and inspiring for me. And it was an added treat to hear their firsthand accounts of um, personal interactions with other giants in the field, like Lili Naljik and Mubihat Kutukolo. And then as for how the seminar shaped my own research, um, our readings and discussions particularly, as others have noted of Inaljik, Tanpanar, Kepulu, and Rashad de Kremkotru, uh, raised questions for me about the relationship between and what actually constitutes academic and popular history writing and even history and literature. And our discussions about Kotru's Encyclopedia of Istanbul and Orhan Pamuk's uh, chapter about that in his memoir um, ended up developing into a year-long project for me where I wrote my graduating thesis um, uh, kind of examining the blurred lines between the real and imaginative in Kultur's works and also examined how if you trace the life and afterlife of his works um, it really reflects with remarkable accuracy changes and attitudes toward the Ottoman past in the Turkish Republic and uh, so it's definitely something I hope to pursue further in my graduate studies uh, so I just want to say I'm very grateful that I had the chance to take this seminar and I'm certain that it's something I'll keep returning to in the future. Thank you Jordan. Uh, before turning to the questions, I would like uh, to thank all of the students for their very uh, concise, thoughtful uh, and very professional presentations. Uh, you complemented uh, what we were trying to outline in the beginning in a really, really competent way. Uh, I'm very grateful to you all, and I'm also extremely grateful to you for appreciating the efforts Tun Shen and I put into this course. So thank you. I mean, for, for me, it was a great experience to hear our own student reflections about what we tried to aim by designing the seminar. I mean, we may have failed in certain directions mm -hmm. in, in the seminar, uh, but it was really refreshing. Um, to hear these wonderful insights. And I should also say, uh, this is only the half of our class. I mean, the other half, unfortunately, uh, couldn't make it uh, today, uh, although they really wanted to uh, be with us. Uh, so I just wanted to add uh, that as well. Uh, there are several questions and comments in the Q&A box. Uh, and we have only 10 more minutes. Uh, so if any of our panelists would like to pick uh, a comment or a question and address that, please feel free to jump in. Uh, one thing I would like to say is about uh, uh, the comment saying that there were too many names cited during individual presentations, and this is a really, uh, fair criticism and uh, our uh, uh, attendee is asking for a syllabus. Uh, I, I, I think we'll be happy to share uh, uh, the syllabus of the seminar through uh, the Columbia Global Center Istanbul uh, email and social media accounts. So I personally don't have any reservation for 
sharing, sharing the syllabus. Uh, so I just wanted to add that point. Yes, we, we, we will share the syllabus through the Global Center. I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I also apologize for the abundance of names and references. The other question that's interesting is about the transition from one alphabet to the other. We didn't talk too much about it. And we were, in some sense, very lucky that our students, many of them, could read Ottoman. They struggled with it, but I remember sitting ne next to Nancy, for example, as she had these little pieces of paper and she had transliterated uh, a rather difficult document uh, into um, um, Latin uh, letters and then Yasemin struggled so hard with that 1910 article on the archives mm -hmm. that um, I mentioned earlier uh, but ultimately it worked somehow it did not present a big problem for us however of course it's a very very dramatic change what do you do when uh, the alphabet is gone. And I think this was not so much of a problem for the early generations of the Turkish Republic, <laughs> but then it became a very big problem for later historians. And we all had to go back to the drawing board and take courses on auto how to read Ottoman paleography. And it was a challenge. Do you want to add on this? I just remembered uh, an interview with Halil Inaljuk that we assigned in one of the first weeks of the seminar. And uh, the interviewer was asking Halil Inaljuk, how were you able to uh, read so fluently the documents in the archive? Uh, and he was saying, well, I was born when the empire was still there and I was trained in the first place in this very alphabet and language. So it, it wasn't a big uh, issue for, for me. So I, vividly remembered that remark by uh, Halil Inalji. Uh, just a little thing I also would like to add after hearing all of our students' presentations um, is that uh, I think it became uh, clear that many of the figures we mentioned today were not historians by training. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Nazem Ikmet, Köprülü, uh, Ömer Lütfü Barkan, uh, uh, Yusuf Akçura and others, and Suheil Unver, I mean, they were not trained as historians, but the, the, the, the historical knowledge they produced uh, is kind of our central focus uh, uh, in the seminar as well as uh, in today's uh, uh, panel. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, point, not to miss it. Um, Let me see if there are... There is a question on why uh, we said you couldn't study the original documents in the archive. Uh, maybe one of the students could answer that. I can take that one if you want. Yeah, please. Uh, so when you go to Başbakanlık, uh, or I guess today is Jumur Başbakanlık Ottoman Archives today, uh, what happens is you enter this big um, reading room where, in fact, you don't... Uh, often have access to the actual physical uh, archival material, but you are presented with lots of desks with lots of computers on them. And on those computers are databases uh, installed where you can search for the documents that you're looking for. And you, if you um, basically, you don't even have access to internet through these computers, but you do have access to uh, the scanned versions of the documents on site. But that's, what, that's all you can see. So what you can see is only the scanned versions of the original documents. Unless uh, you have a particular reason for wanting to perhaps see the, the, the, the paper, the quality of the paper, or maybe it's that so badly damaged that it could not be digitized. Like those are the exceptional cases and then you would be able to see the physical documents. But uh, the sheer volume of the documents and you know, questions of capacity, but other questions, you know, they the regular researcher is basically not permitted to see the original physical documents. There is a question on, uh, from Mehmet Kentaj on Osman Nuri, oh. as who knows everything about uh, Osman Nuri. Uh, he is wondering whether Osman Nuri uh, 
as an ar archive creator and gatekeeper uh, became part of our discussions as well as his legacies to urban history. Yes, all of those. We dis when we discussed his, uh, it was very difficult to discuss him because uh, uh, Mejele is so long, uh, but we realized what an archive he had provided. Uh, for the future generations, as well as uh, him as a historian. Of course, even when it looks as though it's so dry that it's just documents, well, there's something about the way you select those documents. You have an agenda. And what was that agenda? And somebody who was in uh, municipal affairs doing this kind of archive building was also very interesting. We discussed him, I'm sorry, we didn't have the time to get more into uh, the details of that discussion today. Johanna, would you like to pick that question on careerism? Yeah. There was a question on careerism um, where I had a few thoughts about, um, I think it is true that, you know, to be fancy today, to be attractive, <laughs> To be read to get attention it is good to or people strive to be cutting edge in in what they're writing and maybe reading text that from that perspective might appear a little antiquated um, is maybe not the first thing that comes to your mind of doing um, but i had a different um i had um, a different idea that ties back to what i said in my presentation when it comes to careerism um because it is very Academia really is thankful for making big claims. And this also um, encourages us to do this um, conceptual transfer that I was talking about earlier. Um, and this just came to my mind that the book that I mentioned on um, the Ottoman Age of Exploration that transfers um, a Western concept to Ottoman history was one of the books um, on Ottoman history in the year 2010 that got the most attention and even nearly won a history prize. Um, for general history, which is not very common for Ottomanists. So I think, um, I think careerism is something that needs to be criticized and I'm always an advocate for more modest um, claims and yeah, modest history production. Um, yeah, that's, that were my thoughts about that. Uh, thank you, Johanna. Uh, there is a particular question about Sabri Ulgen I can speak about him for, <laughs> for hours, so please stop me. Uh, the question is whether Ulgenar, uh, I mean, what kind of a historian Ulgenar was, and Ulgenar was not a historian. I mean, he was an economist and a sociologist, uh, and what he wrote in his uh, monograph published in 1951, uh, I'm trying to remember uh, the full title of, uh, of the book. Uh, I think it was... Uh, so the issues about mentality with regard to the economic decline, or our own economic decline. So the, the, the, he basically engaged with the question of whether, uh, I mean, why Ottomans uh, were not engaged with the, the capitalism. I mean, what, what, what, why was the empire so late uh, in, in uh, adopting uh, that kind of mentality and mindset. And he, for, to, in order to answer to that question, he looks at Ottoman poetry, the Sufi manuals, uh, narrative sources produced from the 14th and 17th, 18th centuries. I mean, it's a very refreshing way of uh, uh, treating a question like this. I mean, he is pretty critical of uh, Ottoman uh, economic mindset and he, uh, finds the answer to that question in, uh, in those uh, literary and narrative sources he examines as a sociologist and economist. That's what makes him as, as a historian, as far as I, uh, I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to add that point on Ulyan Ash. There is another interesting question here about, and it's, it's a little bit of a criticism, I think, to the panel that we seem to have focused only on the Bashbakanlık Arşivi. What about the, uh, and it's very well taken, what about the other archives 
What about other ways of uh, learning about Ottoman history? I think we addressed it a little bit, but perhaps one of you can, one of the students can pick up on this. I can pick up on I mean, a, a few um, concrete examples. I mean, I think that the question uh, was framed as sort of queering, queer, queering the archive, um, which is very well taken. Um, but I remember when, I mean, on an even more basic level than that, I remember when, um, uh, we had professors, uh, uh, Leslie Pearson, Yoshiko Hanayonu, come to visit us. And I think it was Professor Pierce who pointed out, well, it's funny when we think of Ottoman official archives, we think about the Bashkakamak Archive, but there's all of these local archives, more local archives um, from more quote unquote provincial <laughs> parts of you know, modern day Turkey, for instance, but not just you know, in the for former Ottoman Empire more generally, and that these are also um, places or possible sources from which to do um, not just political histories of those areas, but also social histories. Um, looking at those sort of more more local more local records but i think that in terms of this more conceptual question about i mean wh whom do we consider to be part of ottoman history and the ottoman archive i think this is a question that i often butt up against you know uh within jewish studies right um that um we don't really talk about galante so much um you know as as a as an ottoman historian um and and yet I find it, you know, having having looked at his letters um, and the fact that, you know, he was actually in correspondence um, with a number of Turkish officials um, uh, in, in regards to the sort of formation of the history textbook in the early years of the Republic, um, it's actually very necessary to see him within the sort of late Ottoman and then Turkish Republican context. Um, but something, I mean, for a lot of different reasons, he's been sort of siphoned off as part of Jewish history and even more siphoned off as a part of Sephardic uh, studies. Um, when, and, and we have a lot to lose when we sort of narrow our frame of who is considered an Ottoman subject um, in that sense. So thank you for that, that question. If I may add to this a question of the archives, I think one of the ways in which the course made me conceptualize archives in a way that I hadn't before is in the first two weeks of the course, we were all assigned in groups to look at collections of um, journals, uh, including the Tari, Osmani, and Jemini Mejmoas, Vakaflar, Belletan. I was in a group that was looking into Toam, so Tari, Osmani, and Jemini Mejmoas. And it's a very particular, it's, it's almost a source, but an archive of its own. Uh, it was, uh, so the way we were um, exposed to it at Columbia, we were lucky to have collections of the Mejmoa uh, bound into books. So we were looking at, you know, we were browsing through four or five uh, volumes of these Mejmoa. Uh, so, you know, it's collections of collections in a way, uh, which kind of creates this sort of mini archive you're looking through and you're looking at years of these, you know, issues. And at some point it stops becoming uh, individual issues you're leafing through, but just sort of a, an archive uh, of the people, of the editors who made Toam possible in a way. Uh, so that was very valuable to, to, to conceive of an archive that's, you know, not a space, space you know. It, it, was, it was a collection of um, written journals that had come together to form a, a physical archive that was not a space that could be inhabited. So it, it was for me a different way of thinking about, you know, what is a source, what is an archive, and uh, can a source be considered an archive of its own? I would like to add one sentence to Yasemin's comments. Uh, looking at the journals themselves also gave us a taste for the primary document, the ob object, the primary document as an object. And we were quite surprised when we saw that so many illustrations uh, accompanied the text and they were in color. Money was spent on these publications. So when we talk about institutional support, when we talk about um, state support, this is exactly what we mean. The book that we mentioned earlier uh, on Nakshi was published by the Istanbul University. It is in color. It's a slim book, but very important book. And there is an introduction where the author says, he was encouraged by the rector of the university who said, I'll open my purse for you. Let's do this in color. 
And it is that kind of support that mattered in creating these, as Yasin said so nicely, these primary documents for us. And one little thing to add to both Yasin and Professor Cherik's uh, uh, remarks about the journals, uh, the physical objects, uh, the materiality of the journal is um, uh, the need for keeping stacks in the libraries uh, intact, you know, uh, browsing the physical journals available on the shelves is, I mean, still my uh, <laughs> a weird habit. You never know what kind of an article or a, a study you, you could find when randomly browsing the old journals uh, kept in, in the stacks of the library. So I'm begging for all the libraries around the world to keep their stacks available for the patrons and uh, keep the physical journal, uh, the, the physical bodies of the journals uh, on the shelves. About the interactions between the 20th century, um, I'm not doing this right, sorry. The interactions between the 20th century Turkish and foreigner historians. Would anybody like to uh, address this? We did not look into it. But we know that they knew each other. We knew that they were in contact. They went to conferences together. Um, they also criticized them. But this was not one of our uh, foci in this uh, uh, seminar. Well, yes, they did mingle with, with each other. Uh, the institutes were places where they went and discussed a lot of uh, important issues. Uh, and they were open to public. Of course, there's another thing which we have not brought in, which is the state of the universities in the, uh, in the, during, the during World War II, which with the um, presence of immigrant um, scholars had turned into intellectual forums for uh, the entire community in Istanbul especially, but to some degree in Ankara as well. We, did, we may have talked about them in passing, but we did not really, dis we didn't have the time, honestly. Um, Xavier, you want to address the archive issue. Yeah, so one of the things that um, I kind of popped out, so I missed the like beginning of the statement, but caught up in terms of the, of the answers and responses. So my mind immediately went back to um, Professor Suraya Farouki's um, art, art article locating Ottoman sources, um, which I recently revisited. Um, and she has like a slew of information and things that you can look at beyond um, Bashbukham Lagarshivi. So she lists the Kokrulu Library, the Atatürk Kutupanesi, the Belediye Kutupanesi. But even if you want to pull out um, Professor Shukrihani Olu talked about looking at, at these smaller archival um, areas in uh, his region of focus, um, particularly in my own case, um, I'm currently in Berlin, which you wouldn't necessarily say is, yes, this is where we're going to find a ton of Ottoman sources, but there is a record of, I think, of 194, um, 194 records uh, that were recorded by a German physician of the remaining Ottoman uh, eunuchs. Um, that are in the Staatsbibliothek uh, Library. Um, and there are places in Vienna, um, all different kinds of ways that you can kind of get at these sources that aren't necessarily, that you wouldn't necessarily say, uh, think are located in these regions. Um, in my own research as well, I tend to find myself shifting between archival, uh, archival material, but also literature as well. Um, so looking at Haji Vatve Karagos um, and thinking about what Arab Baja means, um, kind of tracing these own, uh, these developments in the actual uh, Turkish literature is something that I think we've, we've discovered as a result of this seminar is very useful material. And another thing we, we can add is that our seminar was uh, mostly Turkey centered. I mean, we only looked at uh, uh, how, what was the, uh, the historical knowledge produced in Turkey as a post-Ottoman country. 
but of course, literature was produced in other regions and other countries that were formerly uh, under, under the empire. So what was available in Arabic literature, what was available in Hebrew literature, what was available in Bosnian or other Balkan languages, I mean, these are all uh, further avenues that uh, future researchers can, uh, can go and treat more seriously. Uh, so uh, this Turkey-centeredness of our seminar is something I wanted to uh, uh, mention at, at this point. Nancy wants to add. Yeah, um, perhaps, perhaps as a kind of um, closing word for myself, um, uh, very much um, wanting to add to Tunch uh, John's point about um, sort of the, the Turkey-centered tendencies of, of Ottoman history. I think that one theme that came through in our class was uh, sort of pulling out the sort of discursive uh, resonances between Ottoman uh, discourse about literature and politics with contemporary Nahdawi discourse that was, you know, being published in Arabic. Um, and what does it mean um, that people are saying a, a very similar things, but sort of in different linguistic communities um, at the same time? And I think that this um, this question, I think that Afsana Najmabadi once put it as, how do ideas uh, travel across time and space? is something that, you know, both we as historians and also our historical subjects um, sort of grapple with. Um, and, and that's something I'm very eager uh, to take, take away from, from the class. Thank you both. And thank you to my um, amazing classmates. I think this is a good moment to end. Again, thank you uh, everybody and a great thank you to the attendees as well. Their numbers have dwindled to 84, <laughs> I'm watching. <laughs> but that's a large enough number and it has been a great meeting. Yes, thank you again to the organizers at Columbia Global Centers, Istanbul, Tunis and Sabanja Center, uh, Sakab Sabanja Center for Turkish Studies. Uh, it was great to see all our wonderful students uh, on the same screen uh, and hear their uh, insightful thoughts. Uh, we hope to do uh, this again, maybe in uh, some other format. Uh, so stay tuned for more events on Ottoman history uh, offered by Columbia Global Centers. Uh, 